what will happen if we not only discover that we are souls but we discover that our souls have souls and so there is an infinite ladder towards the ultimate I have often wondered <clears throat> about my state of being. I've wondered about its energetic direction. I have wondered about the value of all existential phenomena in a moment of experience. And so my greatest finding was not only discovering the edge of the language threshold, it was not just a novel reintroduction to the unknown as a moment of knowledge, but it was in some sense the feeling that one gets when they remember how something works. That feeling, uh, you will find it on an existential level. And so at first, I have no choice because it's 2019 and this is the world we find ourselves, I have to start with an audience member <clears throat> with the consideration that I am speaking to the individual, I am speaking to the conscious, and I am speaking to the objective. That means we have to be people first before we talk about humanity. There's no such spirituality. <clears throat> you see, the issue with spirituality is that it can become a trap. They, you know, in, in philosophy, there are two traps, I find. There is the nihilistic trap, and then there is the enlightenment trap. And the enlightenment trap is this idea of forever seeing the endless fullness of experience. And in some sense, the nihilistic trap is seeing the extreme of emptiness. It's as if the person who is trying to get enlightened or doesn't see any meaning in their life, they are at an extreme edge of a sort of psychological axis of their own duality. <clears throat> I think I was um, blessed to be one of the, I find children nowadays, they are being, their attention is being more drawn by the creations of man rather than the world that created man. We are becoming more interested in the worlds of the future than the world that is here now. And the reason is, is because we cannot accept our past. And I am telling you, a lot of suffering comes from this. And it's not an easy thing. To accept your past means to honor life. <clears throat> this is so crucial. To honor life. When I say honor life, not just the contents in your moment, but your whole moment. To honor the living presence of energy. It's like, you know, a, a tired person coming home and he's like, where did God get the energy to create all of this? <laughs> There's some questions. It's kind of strange. It's um, 
It's a sort of internal purity where after you have acknowledged the presence of thought, uh, the, the personification of thought, you in some sense experience <coughs> uh, its absence. You learn from the absence of your own beliefs in the space of the moment. And you will hear the roars of the minds of genius behind people's eyes. There have been moments where I have seen so many people and it's very fascinating. It's like I'm, I'm telling you, in this world, it's kind of like we all see through each other. Seldom this is said, but we see through each other. That means unless there is somebody else, we feel we're alone. And that is the issue. The world didn't like being alone. So it, 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 in some sense, separated to rejoin, to rejoice. Kind of how the mystic poet Rumi on his, de on his death stone, there's like a poetry or something. There's a poetic line written. And of course, I can't remember the exact thing right now, but I remember that he said, celebrate. Do not think that my death is my death. My death, you must celebrate. Because in some sense, he has this line of poetry. He says, I... I was a mineral, I died as a mineral, and I became a plant. I died as a plant and I rose to animal. I died as an animal, and I was man. When was I less by dying? Why should I fear death? I shall die once more as man. To soar with angels bless. But even from angelhood I must pass on. To that which no mind has ever conceived. So this poet Rumi, this dude, saw his attention evolving into the inconceivable. And the moment I saw this poetic passage, just the fact that another human being had seen that far, you don't believe it, I was slow hand clapping from a guy who died 700 years ago. It was remarkable. <clears throat> because there is movement. We cannot say that movement dies. It's like we all know that after the individual, like literally a person dies, other people are born. There is a continuity of expression. It doesn't matter what happens. There was something here. And it saw itself when it was here. You know, the idea the, of the fact that we have one life should, you know, theoretically make us so concerned that we automatically become ethical beings, but it doesn't. It's kind of like people's lives is like a coin flip. And when they flip the coin in, in either way, they either trust the moment or they don't. <clears throat> and the true wisdom is that when you reach a point where your moment trusts you, this is such an incredible state. Because in this state, again, it's, it's, it's kind of like the discovering uh, a state prior to any other. It's when you become your moment. Right now, if I tell you, do you think your body is just this physical body? You will probably say, yeah, man, this physical body is it. I mean, I don't, I don't control other people. You know, I, it's, not, it's not like I think of my hand rising and suddenly the hand of that person across the street rises. It's like I control my body. This is my body. And I would say this is true, <clears throat> but you explained to me this phenomenon, that I slept and had a dream. I'm, I'm, I'm being very serious. I had a free will active in that dream. But I woke up. I woke up and I was shocked. It was, it was in some sense one of the most chaotic moments of my life. Because I realized I could experience living being alive in a certain way, even though my body was asleep, which implies about the, it's as if our minds are so here first that we're not sure if the material universe is actually here or not, because we cannot be sure if we are here or not, because all we have access to is an instantaneous, spontaneous awareness. I am telling you, your soul is new. It's N-E-W. <laughs> your, your soul is attributeless. It's like you're trying to give a color to a glass or that rolls around many colored surfaces. It's impossible. You can never find the soul in accordance to the environment. It's simply like this when a technology is of a higher dimension.
it's kind of like some time traveler took a TV back to the time of like the caveman and gave a remote and he's like, I want to see if this caveman can turn on a TV, right? And so the caveman, he gives the remote to the caveman and the caveman slams the remote, imagine, into his face. <laughs> Not the face of the time traveler, like into the caveman slams the thing in like to himself. And it's as if in that moment you suddenly realize there are so many levels of conscious acknowledgement of phenomena required before the pure geometrical dimensions open up to you. The pure geometrical dimensions is, is a suggestion that right now, you see, it's, it's, it all has to do with languages. <clears throat> we can say that when you're imagining something, your mind is speaking a language that it, uh, strays away from reality. You know, because if I, if you imagine uh, uh, something that hap actually happened to you, we say that's a memory. But if you imagine something that didn't happen to you, we don't call that a memory. There's a discrimination. There's a segregation of thought going on where we're saying this is real, this is not real. And usually it's being pinpointed uh, based on uh, a sort of material reference point. So when it comes to questioning your state, this was something that I feel it's kind of like this. The purpose of life is not that everybody reaches one point, okay? The purpose of life is not trying to make everybody be a clone. If everybody believes in only one thing, that's a world of clones. That's a world where we have literally, are, we are so primitive that we're sacrificing our, our new ideas like like uh, like like lambs and shit for for higher purposes you don't understand the thing is the intellect rebelled against the superstitious the supernatural you know and as it rebelled it conquered so we can say the rational mind conquered certain irrational ideas it hasn't conquered the irrational mind because we're not robots. We can't control the whole civilization. There will be children born who will do chaotic things, and there will be children born who will do ordered things. And the civilization will sometimes define chaotically with itself. That's when it's fucking up. <coughs> and it will dec decide incredibly when it is, in some sense, aligning to what it is. So you can say any civilization which has a blueprint of design that is constantly in its evolution moving away from the natural designer, we can kind of say society, just the idea of us creating societies, it is like a part of us is moving away from nature, but a part of us knows that if we move away from nature, we will die. Do you see? It's a kind of love and hate relationship of a, of a moment in the, in, in the cosmos where you love how you're here, but you hate how there's nothing you know, it's like, really, God, <laughs> you, you gave me an empty galaxy. <laughs> Whether our species is the first to the party, or maybe in some sense, the party is happening. It is not just seeing it. We've had in so many uh, certain, I've kind of scoped it out because how can, how can I tell you, in, in pure metaphysical thought, there is the surrender of individualness to a divine will, always a collective will. You, this, you realize, you know why a lot of human beings seek love? Because in love they can trust what will happen. If they can't trust what will happen, you can never love that moment, you'll hate it. But those people who trust it, they go on the roller coaster ride, they sit in front and they enjoy because their trust is strong. They have more faith than the, the person sitting at the back of the roller coaster, you know? And maybe the person in the back of the roller coaster has faith, but the system only allows two people to sit in the front of the roller coaster. So what I'm telling you is, how are you approaching the moment? And in some sense, how is your mind lifting objective, objective phenomena into the skies of endless subjective meaning? Because, the, to be honest, there's a secret that many poets hide. That their poetry is kind of like the endless rhythms of the cosmos.
we learn from all dimensions of our being. Is it not? That we, if we don't learn, then how the hell can we grow? It's like our minds need data, but they need data that relates to what is actually emotionally justified within the person. Because I've lived in societies where due to the theocratical structure, literally the cunt culture limited be certain behaviors. It's like whether cert a certain um, institution comes and censors the, the news, a lot of it, the news, for example, you want to translate Japanese uh, thoughts into, for example, a different culture, you know, into English or whatever. Any, any transition point, in, it, it, it's how can I tell you, each culture has its own agreements. For example, in the eastern part of the world, a woman wearing a cloth around her hair is very common. But in well, the Western part of the world, it is, for example, uncommon. Do you see? It is an idea which has meaning to two realms in accordance to how they have embraced it. So you want, if you, if we want to get to the nitty and grit, <laughs> nitty gritty point of this, You must learn to dance with heaven and earth. That's it. There's no hell. I don't know who, who brought up hell. You know? <laughs> and I'm not saying that there isn't suffering in this world. Of course there is. I'm saying, you, just because something exists, it doesn't mean that all of our attention for the whole lifetime should be on it. You know, ever since I gave these talks, I kind of became a certain, how can I say it? Sometimes I, I, when I've gotten enraged, I have um, broken an internal law. And let me tell you what I mean by that. You see, the thing is, the depth you see, if you use it, if an ego touches wisdom, both the wisdom and the ego die in that point. But if the wisdom moves the ego, then there is good communication. Then in some sense, the depth of the mind has the potential and the freedom to move beyond any identification. It's kind of like that moment where, you know, in a world where everybody thought they were the same thing, suddenly a person shouted, a, a rebellion had occurred that we are never the same, and we should not be. But at the same time, it doesn't mean we must avoid the unity, because it's all about the brain of humanity. I want you to imagine every culture, every civilization, every living creature is like the mind of the cosmos, thinking. Like, check this out. Right now, I can imagine ocean waves I saw behind my eyes were the same ocean waves I saw in front of me. You see? We are multidimensional beings acting as if we figured out one dimension of our being. You know? <clears throat> the four dimensions of science, of course, there, there's those who argue that there's six. And, of course, string theory entertains 10 to 11. There's many ways you can cut the cake, but on some level, the cake could never be cut. You just have to throw away the tool that is keeping your attention locked on a certain idea.
sometimes I have been, uh, my intuition has slammed me into a sort of silence. That means literally in certain moments of life, I felt as if the further the world, the, my, my intuition was kind of telling me in that moment, there is an unauthorization of karmic access. For many people, karma is consequence oriented. It's effect oriented. But for some people, the concept of karma is a causal form. What that means is that it is not the effect of life. It's as if even though we say there is maya, you know, even though there is movement. <clears throat> what are we living? What can we live for? A part of me feels that in 2019, you know, there's the incredible blessing of online access and a sort of opening of a digital realm. It's as if we can say the internet was the technological realm's first communications with men. I find that the internet is a coliseum around the events of the world. And this is a coliseum where everybody in the coliseum can hear one another and speak to one another. <clears throat> and so what is what are all these people watching their fine tank fine or they're watching a gladiator battle between the known and the unknown? Now, something can happen <clears throat> is that a person thinks they've gotten rid of their ego, then they get into a multidimensional state of mind, and then they interpret the, the transition of their attention, the evolution of their attention, as another personality, so it locks down. You see, it's like in, in the Bhagavad Gita, there was a very important passage. Sometimes I randomly open ancient books. I don't <laughs> and so I opened the Bhagavad Gita and there was a reflection of a lesson I had to receive in that moment and that lesson was that if you follow if you like you see in <clears throat> this is not found in monotheistic Abrahamic religions it is found in kind of polytheistic you know, even though that's not the right word, but polytheistic um, uh, religions as well. So religions where their gods have a hierarchy, you know, just like how we have different classifications and levels and government. So there was a sort of divine government. And so there were gods also living lives among men, but men could not see the gods and the gods could see men, you know. And so it was that kind of reality, that kind of context in ancient Vedic times. So this is a kind of notion that men and gods uh, are living lives. Imagine the guy's like, God, why don't you answer my prayers? And God's like, because I'm busy, man. <laughs> You can lie to others, and you can lie to yourself, and you can tell the truth to others, and you can tell the truth to yourself. Once reality starts from an experiential point, kind of like in childhood before language is ad adopted, so that the child is in some sense a, an observer, a pure observer. The mind always is. You know, it's very hard to say if the mind uh, ever identified with emptiness uh, or if the mind is a reaction of phenomena to emptiness, you know? 
it's as if the darkness had to come first before the light. And so for me, if the cosmos was, we, we entertain the notion that from nothing something came, like the Big Bang, it's, it's a kind of strange notion because it's like, imagine a pitch black dark room. You can't see nothing, but you're aware there is nothing, right? And now imagine out of nowhere something appearing. So what this means is that the pitch black emptiness of our cosmos is a room, but not a room in our dimension, not in a room we can understand, but it's bound, it has boundaries that serve a, a higher purpose. And when I say higher purpose, I'm not trying to be new, new age, literally it is, it is like imagine uh, the game of giants and we're watching on, on their shoulders. It's as if they asked this guy, do you have enemies? And he said, I have one enemy. And they said, who is that? And he said, myself. We are the definer of how far we go. Your mind, per se, is not always defined by its ability to observe creative phenomena. Sometimes some people could really intelligently observe how something uh, breaks down rather than is built. There is a beauty to both of it, but the beauty has to do with the universal truth being entertained at the time. <clears throat> it's kind of like your, your car is driving in the highway, but if we were to look at every snapshot moment of, of that journey, in every snapshot moment, your car is in a different part of the highway. It is not on the same highway, on the same material, the same atoms as it was before. So it's like <clears throat> the subjective landscape is rolling over the objective phenomenon. It's moving. There's a sort of movement. Kind of like... Kind of like, I don't know why I feel like. I find human beings have a, I mean, of course, the reason I'm constantly acknowledging it that way is because we have to learn to see from more than just our eyes. That's kind of like what the mind gives you an access to. The mind gives you an access to look at sensors, the same sensory data in many ways. And so because we have a notion that time is moving forward, we have a sort of future to enter. So in some sense, without time, could there be a future? Without space, could there be time? It's as if where would time move forward in if there was no space? It's kind of incredible. I, I've kind of said it that the educational systems all around the world, they're going to experience an apocalypse. It's going to be that moment where the person, the professor is introducing his colleague to his room where all his certificates are on his wall. And in that moment, you know, the professor says, look at this wall. And the colleague looks at it and he's like, 
there's, I don't see any certificates. And the, the professor turns around and sees all his certificates on the wall have become mirrors. They were self-reflections of certain moments. Life is too dynamic and the contribution has to be dynamic. So Mr. Within is saying the Nobel uh, Prize should raise its standards. <laughs> The Buddha, after attaining enlightenment, he opened his eyes as his back looked to a tree. He saw his friend Ananda there. Ananda looked at Buddha and noticed as if he has become someone else. And he looks at Buddha and he says, tell me, tell me, what did, what did you realize right now? And Buddha looks at Ananda, and that's it. There is no answer. There is no answer. Silence. The unknown. The pure. The divine. It's like trying to open your eyes, not realizing it's just a blindfold. Guys, your eyes are, are always there. It's the blindfold. It's that illusion. It's like wearing sunglasses at night and wondering why the stars look dim. You know? It's just... <laughs> When you take a walk <clears throat> into the unknown, what's pretty much happening is kind of like right when you sleep, you're reaching a very important state of mind. You're reaching a, a state of mind where the conscious ego has to trust it's vanishing because it is certain that it will wake up tomorrow. So it's easy to sleep. It's like you can't do anything when you're asleep. So sleep is a sort of inactivity, which means the ego does not exist because the body is not moving in some sense to have a personality, to speak or whatever. So what it is, is that there are dormant minds. So as I'm speaking to you right now, it's not just human beings that are evolving. It's pretty much every living creature you see. I want you to imagine these spheres just popping out from inside the earth, just arising out. These ethereal, ethereal spheres. I'm telling you, we are, our existence is the marriage of light and matter. And from that, all of this is, all these narratives arise. The light in our eyes became the foundation of any sort of abstract consideration of any dimension. Okay, 
should definitely change the song. The greatest contribution of the human mind is an addition of a new dimension of creative phenomena which the, at some point the civil civilization may use. People should begin living lives where they're creating, uh, they're expressing their, their intelligence throughout the day and they're doing it through various streams of attention. So, so one attention can be, it's like there's, a, when I get an idea for example, I tend to see just a snapshot scene vision in my mind. So when I get this snapshot scene vision in my mind, what I do is I, I can write it. I can just keep that snapshot image there and kind of animate it, let it animate. Or in some sense, I can uh, say it or I can just watch it come and go. Do you know, do you know that everything you hear, you don't have to uh, react to? That's an ability. As Aristotle said, you entertain an idea without accepting it. It's like there is a sort of freedom in society, but in order to achieve this freedom, there requires a deviation from the true uh, nature of the person. That means simple people in a complex world may feel uh, overwhelmed. And complex people in a simple world may feel enraged. We have to learn to wield our emotions internally. It's as if just like you're, uh, you're, you, you catch your hand before it moves. You observe the thought before it reacts and hits your personality and becomes a belief. His attention beams towards the heavens. The mind rotates into a new orbit. Learn to pilot your attention. To pilot your attention means to discover truly the meaning of everything in your plane of existence. Sometimes you reach the edge of external meaning and you find the, you know, beginning to internal meaning. That means like a person may have a ring on their hand and somebody says, why do you wear that ring? And that person says it's because that ring has an internal meaning. 
it relates to how the mind of the person has lived rather than the constitution of their atomic physical nature. It's like wanting proof or truth in a changing world, realizing not only the truth changes, but so does any sort of proof. I do want to give a share a certain commentary on the archetype of the messenger. I feel many people nowadays are afraid of communicating on this topic. Let me tell you why. Because we're worshiping language. We're language worshipers. Because we're language worshipers, anytime new language, new ideas come about, we feel scared. So we fight it. This is why cruelty remains, because people want to be comfortable not realizing your comfort has to break, so the whole system changes. Your behavior is, is, has to, in some sense, be, you have to begin caring for dimensions of the world you never knew existed. Which in some sense translates as the life of your species. That's it. You know? Because nowadays we're reaching certain, I find, <clears throat> a sort of situation that no longer people can be all, like even though people have gathered around, back in the day the tribes were small, so when there were big findings, everybody lived abundantly. Okay, but now our population has increased to such a degree that we, no, we have no longer levels of abundance. We have to have, we have to enter a society and through certain systems of, uh, of, of, of safety function and safety and security function, you see? And so civilization is a great development. There's no, you can't point fingers in a whole cosmos that is changing. There's no bad guy here. There's no bad guy in the world. We're all just bewildered animals evolving, okay? And we used to be way more savage and fucked up back in the day. But now in 2019, of course, there's still violence, but we are, our attention is changing. It's like we're realizing it's not just about how much of knowledge is properly carried on. It is about how many new ideas enter kind of the veins of mankind. The realization that there is more. Kind of a, 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 a hidden power surging through the eyes of a god that finally realized what it meant to hold the hammer of judgment. That you don't judge the world does. You are simply an actor. You're an actor in, in, a, in a changing world. So you just, the, this is why they say like, <laughs> like these like enlightenment kind of teachings go to words like suggesting that the ultimate person who's realized the ultimate thing is like a kid, like a young kid before learning language. And it's kind of like, what do you mean? It's like they asked these ancient people and they were kind of like, let me tell you what. <laughs> They were like that the child had a freedom that the moment it saw the cruelty of the world, that freedom changed. But that moment where it had that freedom, you were enlightened. Your whole mind was active. No story had enslaved you yet or encaged you. We are not our words. We are the worlds behind them.
there was this notion that victory was not just a personal achievement, it was an awareness to the primary spirit of the attention of all human beings accumulated. Mr. Within is saying that the, we are right now at a point where literally it's our next task to redesign the stories that children will tell themselves. And we have to redesign it in accordance to a value of the biology. So we, you don't understand biology is, the mo is one of the most important uh, fields of study. You know, biologists should get, a, should get paid uh, uh, beyond belief to some degree. <laughs> Not theoretical biologists. <laughs> you protect nature from its own creation only to realize the outcome is, is inevitably war. You breathe as what you are and what is given. Kind of like on an exam, you read the question, you see what is given, your eyes have opened in this world, you watch the moment and you see what is given. When you see what is given, you see that it is your attention that moves in the physical space that suggests how the personality moves into being animate. I find that it is very fascinating, that it's not as if in the act of reproduction during sex, it's like such intense movement, that this intense movement is reaching a sort of peak. It's as if at the peak of the imagination of both individuals, in some sense, arises. Arises the soul, the, the possibility for a soul of a child to emerge. A sort of biological need. And it's, that, it's like that moment where the husband looks at, uh, you know, It's kind of like you see nature and you smile at her and that is life. I feel that's too far. <laughs> there is a state though. In the Rigo Gita, it says um, as you your mind has a sort of a position simply because your body is claiming the temporary position. You can say even though if we physically get our bodies towards imagine there's immortal technology, technology that makes human beings immortal, we live forever. What's gonna happen is we can prevent the biological death, but we cannot prevent the subjective death which will endlessly occur. It's as if the mind has to give itself a break from matter. It cannot remain in this structure all the time. You know, kind of like uh, you are sailing in manifestation as a conscious creature. What can you do? It is all just the beauty of truth. The truth is kind of, it's like something you didn't expect. So normality could not see it. Kind of like that saying that says, uh, um, jump for the moon and you'll land in the stars. I don't know, something like that. <laughs> it's kind of like you jump for the ultimate truth. You aim for beyond the language threshold. But regardless whether you make it or not, you are thrown somewhere beyond your original position. Your own efforts are sculpting your identity, your mind. Your behavior is based on your past decision, literally how you behave or how, uh, in some sense, the image of the world is alive in your mind, which leads to you. There's a poet who says, uh, his name is Atta, he speaks about the soul of the soul of the soul. 
like we sang journey towards the soul of the soul of the soul. And we go see in the Vedic tradition and metaphysics, they have kind of the Atman and the Parabrahman and, and various levels. I find eventually there will come a moment where you will realize it's not about energetic animation. It's not about trying to be something that you arrive somewhere. It's kind of like uh, you watch and as you watch the mind settles. The mind is like a pump. Thoughts and data and everything is creating ripples on it. When you stop doing anything just and sit there and just watch regardless of the kind of technique some guy can say yo man meditate like this and that it's like you know don't have thoughts it's like you, you shouldn't care you should just sit still and silent and watch just watch what happens to your mind and you will eventually come to the silent moment and, in, and through the silent moment you will begin hearing the noise of your mind so you begin eventually noticing thoughts and that's a good thing you should, it's not like that. whoever said you shouldn't have thoughts I had no idea what they were saying. You know, because it's uh, thoughts are not something you choose. It, they, they are kind of like it's an internal art gallery you're walking through. You know. <laughs> when we see that regardless of what kind of truth we're looking for, that truth will eventually also be experienced as a momentary phenomena, then the ultimate state is to see how the momentary phenomena changes. So one can say the, pure, the peak edge of the evolution of the individual identity is to a point where it realizes after it has completed a total awareness of its individuality, only its collectivity is left. After you have lived your perfect life, you will wonder about the perfect life that your civilization can live. That is greatness. When it doesn't matter who makes it up the mountain, the species must move on. This is why you just imagine there was a sort of, if the world truly wanted to help itself, it would be 10,000 years ahead of its time. <sighs> Thanks for tuning in, guys. <laughs> Much blessings and all stay. I think that's a, this is kind of humorous point to end off. Here. <laughs> and I'll tell you this, Schrodinger's cat never died. And Schrodinger's cat uh, was never, never like kind of was alive. Let me tell you what I'm saying. Like, rather than the cat being alive or not, <laughs> the cat could not have existed. It is the edge of the multi-dimension in, in regards to the uh, language. Study your moment of being. What greater teaching teaching him? Look at nature, look at the wallpaper I've put to this talk. You think th those trees require teachings? You think those trees require to be enlightened? You think natural phenomena needs to have a purpose or rather it, it is a kind of collective journey. You have to appreciate what you are or you deny your intelligence to, uh, uh, to act in. You must care for the world. That you, you get energized that way. You know, people don't understand this. Your energy is in accordance to what is important for you. So it doesn't matter how much hard it was what you did that day. If you did something that raised the value of everything, literally you had the greatest day of your life, as if you did the greatest working day of your life. It's as if in that moment, in that coffee of that after like victory celebration, you know, I playfully have this thing where sometimes when I succeed in certain areas that I've been attempting for, uh, to succeed at for a long time, I have a, a coffee and like this silent moment where I just, just very quickly, it's like I have no reaction, no cel 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 like celebrating kind of reaction. I just put 
I just tap behind my, I tap my own back as if like, kind of like, uh, celebrating myself in some sense. I don't know how to say. Beyond our eyes, the whole cosmos is watching. 